is the grid itself. And so we can extract only the grid from the image. Once we've gotten to this point, we need to try to find the corners. And so we do that by first um, making initial guesses for the corners of the image of the, the grid. We do that by finding the pixels that are closest to the, the frames of the actual image itself. Uh, and we use those as initial guesses. Then what we do is form a projective transformation of that image by using those initial guesses like this. Well, this is a particularly good guess, um, but in general it won't be good. What we do is we take this, this red template and we move it around the, uh, the region where the corner should be. And this is the perfect uh, corner, what a how perfect corner should look like. And as we move it around the, the, the area where the corner should be, we, at every position we add all the pixels along each arm of this template. And based on which position has the highest pixel count, we, we uh, hypothesize that that is the actual corner location and adjust our coordinates. But we repeat this process many times in order to keep updating and eventually find the actual corner locations. So once we've found these corner locations, as I said, we can form a projective transformation and form an image like this. This is actually, we use a very low resolution image of the board. And the reason we do that is that it makes the piece detection much faster, which is very important to us to have the piece detection be fast. So we actually only use four pixels per intersection um, and store the image like this. And so this image is kept as a template of the board to compare with in piece detection. So that's the next algorithm I'm going to talk about, which is piece detection. So once we have these calibration parameters, we can uh, form projective transformations of any image, like this one with pieces on the board. What we do is we subtract that template from this image. Well, we, depending on which image is subtracted from which, you get white. We get these blue uh, pieces for the white pieces in the one image, and you get these brown uh, pieces for the black pieces in the other image. And when you extract the relevant color channels, you get images like these. So those are the uh, white, piece, white pieces, and those are the black pieces. And in both images, we go to all the intersections. Because we know that the image is projected already, we know where all the intersections are. We can look at each intersection and take a small window around each intersection and average all the values of the pixels in that interesting <coughs> region and use the threshold to make a decision whether there's a piece there or not. And then finally, once we made all the decisions, we form what we call a configuration matrix. This is just a portion of the configuration matrix that shows the <coughs> configuration of that original image that we used. And um, basically, twos are where the white pieces are, ones are where the black pieces are, and zeros are where the empty spaces. So using these configuration matrices, we can then go and try to use the rules of Go to decide whether two configurations logically follow each other based on the rules such as you can only place one piece at a time, you can only remove pieces if that, those pieces have been completely surrounded by the opposite color, stuff like that. But we take it a step further and use what we call a hypothesis mechanism. What happens is if a new move comes in, at first there is no hypothesis. It is compared with the last stored move and the logical chain of moves. And if it logically follows the last stored move, it becomes a hypothesis move. Then, when another new move comes in, it's compared with both the hypothesis and the last stored move. If it logically follows the last stored move, but not the hypothesis, it replaces the hypothesis move. If it logically follows the hypothesis move, then the hypothesis move is stored and confirmed, and the new move becomes the new hypothesis. The other way that hypothesis uh, configurations are stored is through timer. And what happens is if every new move is identical to the hypothesis, a timer is incremented, a counter. And when this, this counter reaches a certain value, the hypothesis is automatically stored. So this would arise, for example, in the last move of a game. You wouldn't have additional moves to confirm it as a, as a pot that would be a correct move. So it would just time out and store it automatically. And so this whole mechanism basically safeguards against false positives, which can occur if you have a hand that goes in front of the camera and looks like a good configuration of the pieces. So this safeguards against that. So finally, we, once we had this image processing module that had functions like these, uh, we basically converted the MATLAB to Java using the Java Global Toolbox. And this, uh, the reason we used Java was that we were very familiar with it, and it had a very good socket programming, programming API. And so basically, the GoGame server houses this image processing module and provides all the functions. It listens on TCP port, TCP port 7179, which is ASCII for Go, for connections from the administrator, and communicates using our GoGame report protocol. <laughs> Uh, it also manages all files associated with games, including the SGF file and a manifest file which contains all the names of different games and the files associated with those games. Uh, finally, it provides any feedback to the administrator, including if errors occurred or anything like that. 
So now Dan or Danny will go over the user interface. So on the main web page is the user interface that takes the form of a Java applet. That means the user only needs the Java runtime environment to view the game. So in order to view the game, what happens is the user can select from the game list, and once the game is selected, it will bring the SGI viewer into the manual mode. In this mode, the user can step through all the recorded modes using the navigation buttons. Now, if the user wants to view a live game, what happens is the user can invoke the auto mode, and that will cause the SGI viewer to be updated in real-time fashion. Now, the user also has the option to download the SGI, SGI file by pressing the button. Up next is the M interface. On the main web page, there is the link right there for the admin login. By clicking on that link and entering the password, they will bring the admin <coughs> to the interface. In this interface, you can see the game feedback text box. In this text box, feedback will be provided constantly throughout the game recording process. So the admin connects to the server. Once a connection is established, what happens is the admin has the option to create a new game, load or delete previously recorded games. To do so, the admin has to fill in the game alias, file name, and two other fields with default values that can be changed, which are the camera IP and the weights for the calibration. So in this case, the admin creates a new game. After a game is created, what happens is, let's say, the admin does not have a direct view of the board. So the admin can bring up the video stream. Now, this video stream is extremely useful during piece detection as well, when we want to detect the pieces, because it provides a visual feedback for the admin to tell if moves have been correctly coded. Next, the admin starts camera calibration, and once calibration is completed, the alignment image will be displayed on the SGI uh, viewer over here. And this alignment image will tell the admin if calibration has been successful. In this case, it is successful. And at any point in time, the admin can switch between the different modes in the SGI viewer. And next, the admin will start his detection, and moves will be recorded in a real-time fashion until the admin stops his detection. And they will bring the SGI viewer into the manual mode. In this mode, the admin will have the flexibility to modify the SGI file, which is an added feature to this lower left corner interface that we built. To complete the recording process, the admin can close the game and disconnect from the server. And now Dan will talk about the final performance of the system. Okay. So our system completed all the requirements and exceeded several of them. Uh, the five most important ones are piece detection time. Originally, it's supposed to work at 0.5 seconds. We got it down to 0.35 seconds. This is really good because players can play at a more natural pace. Uh, camera calibration time, it was supposed to be 60, we got down to 40, and viewer update time, was supposed to be 10, we got down to 6. For accuracy, the piece detection, uh, we were required to get it at 95%, and our newest algorithm, it's at 99.5%. Uh, camera calibration, it, we had the requirement of 90%, and we're just about at 90%. Uh, we also have added features to the system. There's the live video feed, that the admin can watch. Uh, both the admin and user interfaces are online. The admin has the ability to modify the SGF file. And our system can have several cameras and work out with one server. So the beta cost of this comes out to about uh, a little bit over $1,300. The, the only reason why it's this high is because the server the, is about $1,000. You can switch this out with any server you'd like or any computer. The only thing they have to get exactly the same is the Panasonic network camera. This is because part of the code was written around this. All right, so in conclusion, we think our project was very successful uh, because we met all our requirements and um, you know, qualitatively it's a good working system. Uh, but there are always future improvements that can be made. Um, one of them is that when you, every time you create a new game, you have to run camera calibration to, to calibrate the camera and get the empty grid image even though the camera might not have changed its position. And so this is inconvenient for the, uh, for the administrator. If we could have a way of sharing information between different game sessions about the camera's position, uh, it might be a little bit more convenient for the administrator. Also, the fact that the piece detection algorithm requires that empty grid template to, use to detect pieces means that if you are loading a game in a to in the next day in a totally different lighting, you're going to have to remove all the pieces from the board to run camera calibration again and capture an empty grid template, and then replace all the pieces again and continue from that point. That also is inconvenient. So if we could have developed a piece detection algorithm that doesn't rely on this empty grid image, then maybe it would have been a little bit more convenient system. Also, there's a lot of communication between the different modules using files, uh, including this config file, and there's a potential for multiple games to, if they try to be created exactly the same time, to be a conflict. We think that this is dangerous. If we could find other channels.